Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us this evening's lecture, which is the opening event of this week's uh, conference on calculating capitalism. I'm uh, Will Derringer. I'm a fellow here in the Society of Fellows in the Humanities. And on behalf of the Society of Fellows and the Hyman Center for the Humanities, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Jacob Soule, Professor of History and Accounting at the University of Southern California. Among the most innovative and ambitious scholars in the field of intellectual history, Professor Soule's work has shown that to understand the history of thought, we must understand the practical history of thinking, of the many mundane and often overlooked activities that go into making, storing, and transmitting ideas. Professor Soule received his PhD from Magdalen College, Cambridge in 1998, and has subsequently taught at Princeton, Rutgers, and the European University Institute before his current position at USC. His work has been honored by the American Philosophical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and most recently, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, who awarded Professor Soule a MacArthur Fellowship or Genius Grant in 2012. He's the author of new, numerous articles, reviews, and editorials, including a wonderful New York Times uh, op-ed in 2009 titled Avoidance by the Numbers, um, as well as now three books, each of which has recovered uh, in its own way the formative role of a different kind of intellectual practice um, in the shaping of modern politics and governance. So in his first book, Publishing the Prince, History, Reading, and the Birth of Political Criticism, Soul looked at editing and the remarkable influence editors and publishers had in making Machiavelli's political treatise into the ra radical Machiavellian text it came to be. In his second book, the key practice in question was broadly archiving. The information master, Jean-Baptiste Colbert's secret state intelligence system, examines the role that new techniques for gathering and organizing politically useful data from antiquarian scholarship to architectural plans to espionage played in the development of modern statecraft. And most recently, Professor Soule has turned his focus to a new practice to accounting. And this evening, Professor Soule uh, will be speaking on his new book, just published by BASIC, entitled The Reckoning, Financial Accountability, and the Rise and Fall of Nations. It's a remarkable tour that spans at least eight centuries and half a dozen countries. Uh, in The Reckoning, Professor Soule examines the profound historical consequences of keeping good books from Lorenzo de' Medici to Lehman Brothers by way of Dante and Dickens. And with that, Professor Soule. Uh, thanks to thanks for coming, and uh, thanks to the Hyman Center, and thanks to Will. To Will. Um, a lot of this book comes from talking to him and from his work, and I feel like we, we and some others in this room have been working on this project virtually together for uh, a long time. Um, I basically, this book actually started, I, I started by trying to write a book about how people build successful states. I was very interested in state building, and I was interested in the elements that we often overlook in state building. And so what happened was I started going into state archives and just looking at the elements um, that, that were there when people were building states, the intellectual interests, the players. And one of the things I found, uh, I found many accountants. And I thought, this is really interesting. I mean, here we are at these great moments in Tuscany, uh, uh, in, in the Quattrocento, in the Renaissance, and here we are in France, and here we are in Holland. And each time I found accountants, not just in sort of backup roles, but as these great leaders. And I was like, this is really fascinating. But as I was doing that, uh, the crisis in 2008 hit, and I sat and I watched uh, uh, the crisis unfold, and I watched uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers collapse, and I watched the footage as the accountants moved in at night, only to discover, even though their offices were just across the street, uh, that all the CDOs and their, uh, uh, their, their bundles, their mortgage bundles, were worthless. And I said, this is it. We're going to have this amazing discussion about accounting. And I said, this is, we're going to talk about why it works, why it doesn't work. They're going to hold up the accounts, and we're going to discuss the accounts, because that's what happened in the 18th century. Uh, in Will's work, uh, in the bubble, it happened in uh, France later, before the revolution, and um, it never happened. 
And I thought, wow, that's really an interesting disconnect. I wonder if there's a story here. And it made me sort of start thinking about financial crisis in a cultural way. And right now, there are, there's a lot of interest in financial crisis and, and, and uh, income inequality, and people are looking to economists. And I sort of thought, at least for this conference, that I would just bring Max Weber back into the picture because I started thinking about culture uh, and, and things like ethics. And I was very, very interested, for example, in uh, I was very, very interested in why people overlook accounting. So what I started doing is I started not just looking at states that worked. I started actually looking for other moments where accounting failed. Uh, and it was a sort of a, an odd trip. So what I did is I went to the archives of some major states and looked at the accountants and the role of accounting. I went to the Medici, and I saw Cosimo's books, and they were amazing, and I saw how he and people around him used accounting remarkably. But then I also, as, as many business historians know, um, I found that later they fail at accounting, they drop it. This is actually the ledger in which um, uh, Francesco Sassetti stops balancing the books uh, 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 in the 1470s, uh, and essentially the Medici Bank goes bankrupt, um, uh, or starts going belly up, and they start they start uh, uh, raiding the city coffers. Um, I, and I just kept going. I kept going to these sort of moments. I went to the first accounting manual, which everyone holds up as this incredible moment of rationality and finance. And the book was a flop. Book histor historians and intellectual historians have really never examined this book. And the book didn't do very well to the point where uh, uh, Luca Pacioli, who is credited with this manual, was very unhappy with how the book did because there was a new ethic in Europe at this time, as this merchant Italy, sort of, it's merchant Italy declined, um, and Spain rose up, princes became more uncomfortable with actually using accounting themselves. I went and I studied Philip II, who was this, the great emperor of the Spanish Empire, uh, famous for his administration, and I started looking at his accounting policies, and there's a lot of work that's been done on this, by um, Spanish business historians. And it was amazing. He came up with some of the most remarkable accounting reforms I've ever seen, incredibly modern, but he never brought them fully through. He, put, he tried to find accountants. There weren't many in Spain. He sponsored the first um, a manual on double entry in Spanish. It didn't do very well. And all of these incredible reforms he did dropped. And I thought to myself, wow. Here we actually have this history, and I set out to write a book about how accounting and states worked, and I ended up sort of writing a book about that, but also how it constantly failed over and over again. I thought, this might be a cultural tradition. Um, and so I sort of kept digging, um, and I went to Louis XIV, and it was the same thing. He became fascinated by accounting. He learned accounting. He had his minister, Colbert, um, create golden account books for more than 20 years that he kept in his pocket. But when uh, uh, you know, his accounts went bad during the wars and the building of Versailles, he stopped it too. So this was a sort of amazing thing. At this point, I was looking, I just kept looking. I kept going to different countries and going to different archives and going to different traditions to see what I could find. And I ended up in Holland. Um, and what I found in Holland really struck me. Because when I went there to start looking for the history of accounting and doing some work in the archives, I also ended up going to museums and also remembering paintings that I had known. And I discovered that there was a huge accounting genre of paintings in, uh, in uh, uh, the, the Flemish Dutch tradition. This is an, an early painting, actually, of the Medici branch uh, uh, director, Tommaso Portinari, who gives bad loans and keeps bad books. Um, he actually painted this before he, he had this painted, he paid for it to be painted, before he actually went bust uh, in, in the Bruges uh, branch. But this was a sort of remarkable painting of a financier being judged and facing the final reckoning. And that's actually where I got the idea of the title for the book when I was looking at this painting. But it went on from that. There were images, and you, you can't see it very well, but the Dutch actually were very conscious that their prowess, they were becoming the, the richest small country uh, really on earth at this time. And this engraving celebrates that, 
But it shows Antwerp and all of its wealth. But down here is a, a pictorial explication of double entry bookkeeping. So they actually knew that they had this skill, and they openly celebrated the fact that their mastery of this skill gave them their financial prowess. I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. We, we know that the Dutch actually don't have the same financial crises, so what happened with the Dutch? This story is going to be different than the other stories I have looked at. Um, now, what the Dutch do, which others, which others hadn't done, is they start painting themselves in doing their merchant art, and they create first a genre celebrating their skill. And, and these paintings are well known, um, and, and actually is at the Met, uh, this is a well-known, it's, a, it's a, uh, in the National Gallery, but the Met had it and there was discussion about it, but it hasn't really always been discussed as an accounting painting. But here we see uh, uh, this guy actually named ja Jacobus Schnuck was his name, um, and he lives south of Antwerp, and we see all of his tools of accounting. So the Dutch celebrated this. That's fine. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the Italians had celebrated it and talked about how important it was, I was wondering sort of what made it work, and what I started finding was that the Dutch didn't just celebrate accounting. They actually did more. They celebrated it, but they also warned against the dangers of putting too much faith in it. They warned against hubris. And this painting is my favorite of all the paintings, because not only um, are the books remarkably accurate, and you see this merchant who's made money, and he's done well, and the other side of these panels, um, it shows that the merchant has given money to a city and has been faithful to the Virgin Mary. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, he can't balance his books because the man who owes him money has died, and only death or God can balance these books. And so what the Dutch do is they give a warning. And this painting really fascinated me. And there were more. There were more paintings that actually showed the skill that the Dutch had, but this painting becomes the basis for what I call a series of warning paintings that the Dutch have painted about accounting. Um, it's between uh, Marinus van Rensvela and uh, Quentin Matzies, they start painting paintings once again, showing the skill of bookkeeping. The book the, in the first uh, uh, frame was a prayer book. Now it's an account book, and the wife, because it's Holland, where women actually keep books, um, the wife is looking over the account book, and they're counting their money, and they're weighing it, and they're doing a reckoning. But this motif turns into even more of a warning. Not only do we have the skill, and look, look above, someone spent a very long time, once again, painting all the tools necessary for accounting. The files, the books, uh, those boxes for filing system, the seals, uh, um, all the different things you need to keep accounts. So they're still showing their skill. They're still bragging about these skills of early capitalism. But at the same time, this painting, some think it might be anti-Semitic. There's an argument about it. It's not certain. But it's also showing that people who are good at this can also be sneaky, and one has to be careful and watch out for accounting just as one does it well. Well, this is a message from the Gospel of St. Matthew, um, and in fact, St. Matthew runs throughout uh, this culture because Matthew is not only the um, patron saint of accountants and bankers, but also perfumists. Um, but Matthew, if anyone here has read the Gospels, who was actually Levi, uh, a Jewish tax collector for the Romans who left the counting table to follow <coughs> Jesus, um, he writes the parable of the talents. And the parable of the talents say, that you have to invest your money and make money. But he also warns against following mammon over God. He warns against wealth, and he says to turn away from the accounting table. He gives two messages. And one of the things that's very fascinating is to see early modern European Christians struggle with this dual message. Matthew ends up giving this conflicting messages, and there are struggles. And this, these paintings, I think, are struggles with the image of Matthew, or the, the message of St. Matthew. You've got to be a good manager, but you need to watch out of the worship of money because it can lead to more than just dishonesty. It can lead to folly. And this is really a, a remarkably fine painting um, where those, this is, I mean, the, the painting of the actual, once again, the tools, the books, the files, uh, the, the notes of exchange, uh, all of these things are portrayed in incredible detail in the back of the painting. 
The books are uh, incredibly uh, well shown, the numbers in them uh, uh, are there. I mean, we see incredible detail, but here we have someone twisted by hubris and folly, and they're wearing hats that are crazy. And so there's this, there's this message, once again, that no matter how good you are at this thing that we all must do, be careful, because it can lead you down the path of folly. Now, this went immediately to my mind. I said, wow, this is really a remarkable thing. It's a remarkable tradition, because it doesn't necessarily mean that the Dutch don't cheat. It means that they are aware that this is their tool, but it's a dangerous one, and that they constantly have to watch out for it. They have to be vigilant, and they talk about vigilance all the time. Uh, and they have to watch out for fraud, and they have to, one has to watch out for human pride and hubris in uh, financial calculations. So this is a remarkably sophisticated culture. These were not just cheap paintings, and there, there are many more. Um, these were big paintings. They were often very public paintings. They cost a lot of money. People were investing in this. They were deeply aware this was a cultural project. Well, after I finished the book, um, I was speaking with the former head of the Dutch uh, archives, Eric Kevelar, who's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. And he showed me that I had actually missed, that no one's ever pointed it out, that there are a huge number of accounting uh, 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 paintings, which I'm going to show you in a second. So this was a big tradition. Now, so Holland has this tradition in the 1500s of painting these warning paintings. This is quite fascinating. What happens, though, is in 1581, the seven uh, uh, provinces from the north break off from Spain, uh, from the Habsburg uh, Empire, and become the sort of first modern republic to emerge. And it's a commercial republic. And it's a fascinating place because it is partially managed by not only a famous humanist who's also a master of the waterworks, but who is the most important teacher and the most influential accounting author uh, uh, in Holland in the late 1500s. Simon Stébat, fascinating, because not only uh, did he actually teach accounting to the prince, who was the, the stockholder of the republic, he taught it to Prince Morris. And there's a famous uh, uh, discourse that Stébat writes about his relationship with Prince Morris, where he teaches him accounting, and Prince Morris said, this is incredibly hard. It's very important and very hard. So this is the first time we hear of a prince actually taking part in this. I mean, he's not an incredibly powerful prince, but he's nonetheless a prince. So, but it's more than that. Essentially, in his uh, accounting for princes, Stata says that the head of state needs to know how to keep books because the head of state has to do audits of the state himself. Otherwise, he'll never get a clear view of anything. So he even goes further. He says citizens are going to need to know how to do accounting themselves to be good citizens. So this is really fascinating. Not only do we have an earlier culture of prowess in accounting, of art warning, of celebrating the prowess, but warning of its dangers, but here we have a leading manager of a country making accounting and accounting education for princes and other citizens a major state policy. We know it's a state policy because the state and cities like Amsterdam start paying accounting masters to come in and actually teach citizens how to do accounting. They actually have a program to teach accounting, which is quite remarkable. Um, and I can tell you that the Germans and others are watching them do this. And in fact, the spread of accounting manuals doesn't flow out from Italy, as historians have previously said. If you do the book history and you follow the manuals in the books, they come to Holland, and it's from Holland that the accounting manuals actually spread. And also this idea that you need to do accounting. Uh, and the English and the Germans and the French are slowly watching this go on. Now, um, Prince Morris, it's quite remarkable, learns to do double entry. Um, it was only in 2006 that they found his books in the archives. Uh, uh, I can't remember. They're, right, they're at the Hague. And essentially, these are really, he didn't keep these books, but he oversaw the books, and they were his. They have his seal on them, and he insisted that his personal books and his administrative books be kept in double entry. This is a high, high level. By the way, double entry accounting being 
debits and credits in parallel columns, they have to balance. So there's this idea of balance that's deeply involved with the, with the practice. If you sell a goat for three florins, you, uh, you earn three florins in one column, but you lose the goat in the other, and at the end it all has to balance out. You have to balance your books. There's a kind of moral rhetoric within the story of accounting each time you do your books. You either have or you haven't balanced things out. And the moral is they should be balanced or you should have a profit. Um, now, everybody who knows financial history know that the Dutch invent modern capitalism. Um, they found the East India Company, the first publicly traded firm in 1602, and they also found uh, the Amsterdam stock market. Again, why did they do this? Well, a great, I mean, if you go and you study the history of the Dutch East India Company, a new research is being done in the Dutch East India Company right now, uh, and also of their books, because their books are a funny, odd story of success and failure. Um, but what's really remarkable is that the Dutch create this in great part because of trust. There is a great trust in Holland that most people can keep double entry books and that most people do it quite well. We have evidence of people from all levels of society. There's a famous book, actually I didn't write about this in the book, actually of a prostitute describing the necessity of doing good accounting and that the prostitute does good accounting. We have merchants, we have, we have um, artists, we have everyone talking about the fact that they know how to do accounting. We know that you walk out of Latin school and into one of these city-run uh, accounting schools. So uh, this is quite impressive. We also know that the Dutch have this old tradition of municipal management. Why? Well, they have incredible almshouses. They have great hospitals. Um, there are, it's a merchant culture, so people know how to do this. But also 40% of the country is underwater. And they manage with water boards it's their administrative local municipal administrations, have to manage these water boards. If people mess up the management of the water boards, they go underwater and they die. So there is great pressure for local people to do good administration, and people have to trust their local provincial tax collectors as well as the administrators of these water boards. So trusting the bookkeeping and management of these localities is a matter of life and death for the Dutch. I can't say that it's a causal thing, that this causes the, the Dutch to do this, but it's definitely on their minds. We also know that Dutch provincial tax collecting is some of the best, that in many cases they keep the best records, uh, and in fact, Dutch uh, provincial tax collection is so stable uh, and so trusted that interest rates around Europe are pegged on these tax returns for I think, is it 150 years? A very long time. So Holland has this remarkable um, tradition of keeping books and of people trusting each other. Now, that doesn't mean that things uh, don't go awry. In 1622, uh, the Dutch East India Company starts losing money. And their returns go to 6% from 18%. And there are stories that the directors of the company are doing insider trading deals that they're hoarding things, that they're price fixing, and that actually they're just going to the docks and in many cases stuffing their pants with gold. And we have, um, and so what happens is the shareholders, um, the shareholders actually write a complaint, and it's the first shareholders' revolt in the first publicly traded company, only 20 years after it's founded. So they have a crisis, and I say, wow, all right, this is interesting. What happens in Holland? Well, in 1622, the shareholders of the Dutch East India Company write something called the Necessary Discourse. And in it, they make a call for a reckoning, which is a Dutch word as well. They want well-kept books, kept in the manner of merchants. They complain that the books of the company have been smeared with bacon and eaten by dogs. Um, and, they, and they say, we want the books to be transparent and open. We want them to be public. And we want an audit. We want a reckoning. That's the word for an audit. Uh, and this becomes a huge crisis because they don't relent. And there's basically a petition, there's an uprising of these leading investors, and it goes to Prince Morris's desk. And so I said, wow, I mean, this is a really amazing moment because if we're talking about financial crisis and how to manage it, here is one of the first and most notable crises that we have in a company. How do they handle it? Well, it's fascinating. Morris knows how to actually audit the books. He's been taught how to do it by the most important accounting figure, I would say, at the time in Europe. 
But Morris is also the stadtholder, and Holland is fighting wars, and it's also doing its massive world trade program, and basically what Morris says is fine. I'll do an audit of the books, but for national security or for reason of state, it has to be a secret audit. I will audit them, but I can't do it publicly. And what's amazing is that the citizens of Holland accept this. They actually trust him to do it, and he does it. The books are mildly reformed. The company gets back on its feet, and those practices stop. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, that there's this culture not just of trust, but of demanding audits. That's what comes out of the culture of accounting, that the citizens actually knew that we should demand an audit. We want to see the books. We know, we know how to read them. Please show them to us. But in this case, they don't get the books. The prince says, I'll do it. And they say, well, the guy knows accounting. We trust him. We trust the people around him. It's a small country. So it's not necessarily surprising that everybody knows each other and knows how good each of them uh, is or is not at doing uh, financial management. But they trust him, and he does uh, OK. Uh, that is a, a remarkable thing. Um, this idea, then, of being a good manager becomes a sort of phenomenon it remains a phenomenon in culture. And what happens is, is people in positions of public management start having themselves painted with their books open. And there are about 100 of these paintings all around Holland. This is a completely unknown genre. It's the managers with open books painting. And what's really interesting is in some of the cases, the numbers work out, and you see them doing accounting. There are literally dozens and dozens of these things. Um, and they're holding their books open so that you can see that they've done it. Um, women do it too. And that is very unusual, very early on in Holland. In fact, one of the reasons Ben Franklin loves one of his uh, workers is that his wife is Dutch and she can keep great books. There's there are wonderful American stories about this too, but the Dutch are valued because even the women know how to keep books, which means if you run a business, it's very valuable for a family business. Well, in Holland, even the women are showing with their open books. And look, she's, she's got her hand showing that they are keeping good books, and they are govern, governing St. Elizabeth's Hospital well. Um, this is amazing. And we also, this is actually from Eric Kevlar. Oops, where did that one go? Sorry, it's, it's later. Eric Kevlar uh, actually graphed all these paintings and found them, because nobody, nobody knew they were there. And they're not the paintings you go to see in museums. They're actually often still in these administrative houses or in state buildings. They're not exciting paintings. And once again, people overlook accounting. It's such an odd thing. It's so essential. But culturally, we've kind of left it behind. Well, the Dutch didn't. Um, the Dutch spend a lot of money and time painting and thinking about these things. During the 17th century, it goes even further. Peter de la Cour, who is really one of my favorite political theorists, writes, one of the most remarkable books on uh, political theory. It is a book which is about Republican liberty. It's also about the need for free markets, a very proto-early uh, version of free market thought, but of also tolerance, in which he says, we need Republican liberty, we need freedom of thought, we need tolerance, but we also need good financial management. And after he talks about you know, classical Republican Rome, he goes on to spend most of the book just providing trade numbers, essentially tax accounts from each city to show the wealth of Holland. And so he creates this genre in which he actually shows the power of a country and its political effectiveness by showing calculated numbers from tax receipts. So this is a very unusual book of political theory. But it even goes further than that. Um, the Dutch... Uh, uh, create as their uh, grand pensionary. That's the sort of prime minister figure under the stockholder and who gets into fights with the stockholder. Uh, Jan de Witt, or Johan de Witt, who is a financial whiz. He's a mathematical expert. He's a, a radical Cartesian. Um, and he writes a treatise on the mathematics of curves, very important, uh, uh, I think, in uh, building uh, uh, waterworks. Um, and, and, and that is actually published with Descartes' works. So this guy is a mathematician. He's known for it. And he is running the country. He also writes the first really great treatise on state annuities, which is an amazing thing. Um, and so one could sort of stop here and say, here it is. The Dutch do it. They create this society. They master accounting. They, they even know that it fails. They, they put in sort of a cultural watching and warning system 
for these failures against hubris. But of course, this great mathematician uh, comes up against uh, the Nassau princely family, and he and his brother end up getting uh, killed, slaughtered, gutted, and maimed by a crowd in 1672 who take their guts and their hearts and put them into uh, uh, little containers and keep them for several years in their stores, uh, paid by the Nassau family to kill the DeWitt brothers because they're in conflict with them. I thought, wow, I mean, at this moment, when we get complete <laughs> political modernity, and, and by the way, when, the, when you put this up, the Dutch get a little upset because they say, this doesn't always happen, you know, this was <laughs> the only time this happened, it's a rare occurrence. And I said, yeah, but this is the first moment that we get a financial expert as more or less the head of a state. It's a remarkable thing, and I do find it quite remarkable that they, or he, gets completely gutted in such a brutal way. If you look <laughs> at his work, which is so fine and sophisticated, the contrast is quite remarkable. Um, now, what happens is, is that we know that Holland declines in the 18th century, and the Dutch will also tell you that, is that they start paying more of those paintings again, but at this point they're all cheating each other, and no one trusts anybody, and the bookkeeping is not as good as it used to be. In fact, England emerges as the center of, of, of bookkeeping by the late... Uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, there are about 30 what are called writing schools, which are schools where you learn to write well, and you, you learn to write well to keep accounts, so you also learn double entry accounting. By the end of the 18th century, Britain has a thousand of these schools. These schools are advertised for being for gentlemen as well as normal citizens, and even in some cases for ladies, so they get over this noble distaste of doing accounting, and there's a lot of accounting being done in Britain. Um, this culture sort of expands out in Britain. I don't want to go into a full sort of discourse on this, but it's, it also enters into their artistic tradition. They celebrate accounting. There are a huge number of pictures of British merchants smiling over their books. They're not showing them like in Holland. It's an actual hubristic moment of empire where they're just literally sitting back. Some merchants in 18th century Britain don't keep books. This is very unusual because they're making so much money they've never seen it. And, and they literally stop keeping books. They just, they just just have the money coming in. But there's a whole bunch of these paintings of the smiling account. I mean, look at this guy. He's sitting, his books are a mess, but he's in control. He's an imperial master, lord of the world. And there are his account books. There are his power, but he's so good at them, he even could be nonchalant about it. This is a sort of even more sort of sophisticated vision of uh, accounting. Um, Hogarth also warns, though, that... There are many British people who ignore accounting, so they're still doing warning pictures. And in this case, we have the, the, a Viscount and his wife who have been partying all night, and their accountant walks away with their ledger, which is unbalanced, in frustration. He's got the bills of exchange and the ledger under his arm, and obviously he's thrown his hands up. He gives up. These people don't want accountability. But it's still in art. It's still in culture. Um, now, the, my book goes into much more detail and explains 18th century America and, and 19th century America. And, and, um, but it also talks about, for me, the most important figure in all this, who's Charles Dickens. <coughs> um, this consciousness, this cultural consciousness about accounting is deep in Dickens' work. Dickens' father was an accountant who was a good accountant who was robbed by a bad accountant. And Dickens struggles with the good and bad accountants. In Little Dorrit, there are good accountants and bad accountants. And of course, in The Christmas Carol, we have this whole story of uh, these kind of accounting business owners with Scrooge and, and, and Jacob Marley uh, who keep books but can also be imprisoned by them and also keep bad books. And Marley comes back, and there are numerous engravings of Marley held by chains by his ledgers. Um, and again, this consciousness is there. Dickens talks about it in France. We have Balzac talking about it. We have uh, many other writers of the 18th century writing about accounting. There are songs about accounting. There are poems about accounting. It is very much in people's mind. Um, there are stories, household stories about accounting, about family fights. Um, for example, women were, were allowed to keep accounts, but they couldn't keep accounts for groceries. All these strange things within the culture of accounting. But in 18th century Britain and in 19th century Britain, people actually still discuss them. Now, again, this is a very sort of shortened version of my argument and of the book, and Dickens is my sort of favorite character, but what really strikes me, and I, I'm leaping over 
years and years and years of, of, of accounting history and the history of accountability, but I do want to bring us up to the 20th century and our own issues. Um, still in the 1960s, um, Arthur and Young could show this brochure, the sort of madman brochure, right, of this is a good job, where this guy is clearly scoping out uh, the possibilities that his job offers him as an accountant, and there's a little bit of glamour involved in this. But with all the scandals that will follow accounting, um, and actually the loss of social prestige of accounting, when Arthur Anderson moves accounting to the Midwest and gets this theory that sort of Midwestern middle class people need to do accounting, it loses much of its cultural cachet. That's followed, as we know, by numerous <coughs> accounting scandals. And now accountants are out of view. We don't see them. We don't talk about them. The modern image of an accountant is kind of that. That's the stock photo of an accountant. It's not a great image, okay? Um, and in fact, accountants, there are others. I mean, there are other pictures of just that are in the accounting schools of just accountants in the dark suits looking very, very sort of grim, looking down. But there's none of this great art surrounding accountants. There's none of this cultural uh, uh, awareness. That seems to me to be a huge problem. We don't talk about accountants. In fact, we feel uncomfortable talking about accountants. Today we were at Bloomberg News, and they say they want to write about accounting, but it's not sexy. It doesn't go on the, the front page, and it's also gloomy, because in many cases it's warning about fraud. People don't want to hear it. We don't have that many accounting journalists. You know that financial journalism is in part created by accountants and just the publication, as Will has shown, of ledgers, of balance sheets, of, of company accounts. And what we see in the 18th century is the circulation of these things and the leaking, in many cases, of account books of companies and states. That becomes news and it becomes proto-journalism. And later, um, in the 1830s, when the budget emerges, you get uh, financial journalism growing out of this state accounting uh, tradition. Today, we barely have any uh, accounting journalists. That is very scary. We have 800,000 accountants in the big four accounting firms. All of our lives, in one way or another, very quickly in one credit card transaction tonight, we'll go through one of those big four firms. Somehow through, at some point through well, a computer, but eventually through an accountant, and yet these people remain invisible. We had this massive crisis. No one talked about the accountants. The balance sheets weren't brought out in public and discussed the way they were in the 18th century. In many ways, we've gone backwards, and that has inspired this book, and that's why I wrote it. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I'd be, I'd be delighted to take some questions. Uh, I'm just wondering, you didn't mention Samuel Pepys, and I would have thought he would have yeah, spotted he, a big gap that you have. He's in there. Again. He's in there. He's, he's, the, he's, he's the, well, obviously, he's the most fun because his accounts are part of his diaries, and he accounts for everything, and he does it using the language which he uses. Yeah. And he lives in great fear. You know, he claims to have learned accounting I think, by, from a one-eyed sailor, um, which showed that in the 17th century, it was still harder to learn accounting. But when he deals with the Earl of Sandwich, um, and when he deals with the king, and they don't know how to keep account books, he writes, I fear for this country. Yes. Um, it's quite remarkable. And he himself, this is a funny moment, says, I wish we had accounting like in France, which is so funny, because France is, has such an unaccountable system, but Colbert <laughs> is an accountant. And for a while, France was run by a professional, professionally trained accountant. So uh, it's, yeah, no, Peeps is in there for sure. Um, and he is, uh, I mean, in any one of these topics, you have to bring Peeps up. I mean, he's there for that. Yes. Your story's very much a Western story. Yeah. And I'm thinking of, when we were, especially when we were talking about the waterworks in the Netherlands, I was thinking about you know, the, the Chinese, yeah, uh, who had the same kind of life or death mm -hmm. dependence on management. Sure. Um, is there a sort of great divergence aspect to what you're doing, or how does accounting play out in, in that culture? Well, we have all across the world people are keeping accounts, but only in the West do you get double entry accounting, which is the most accurate and, a, and really is, as Weber and many others have said, the linchpin of capitalism. Why does capitalism emerge in the West, in these European countries? 
economists have felt that double entry bookkeeping um, is one of the reasons. I do believe that's true. That then leads to a very particular Western culture mixed with the scriptures uh, about accountability and about uh, uh, warnings and about balancing and about the reckoning of God. Remember, God is an accountant too. Uh, who keeps the books of life and of death and at the end makes the final tally uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, there are other traditions, but if this tradition becomes the tradition that creates modern complex capitalism. So I couldn't do it all. And so I wanted to follow one tradition as a historian. There are many other stories out there, but this one brings us to capitalism, to empire, and to crashes. Now, obviously, it's much more um, complicated, but it's really only in the 1940s that double entry accounting spreads out across the world. Um, and it's still, I mean, these accounting standards are still fought over. America and Europe, America will not enter into the World Accounting Standards Board, and there are two views on that. And I don't know who's right. It's very interesting. A lot of people think it's better to stick with the Americans, in spite of everything that's happened. So these fights are going on in the background. Most people don't know about them. They are big, big discussions. Sorry, yes. Uh, I, would, I would take exception to your comments that the county is not discussed. Um, I, I, for instance, started a company called Rate Financials, where we rated the financials of other companies starting in the 90s. And there were several of us doing it, you know, comparable firms. So in the profession. Right, in the profession, absolutely. And in the financial analysis and on Wall Street, and in the specialized business publications, and even the general ones like Forbes and the Journal, you will see the articles, and there is a lively discussion about the accounting rules and about the impact of it and the complexity of it and whether the SEC is yeah, enforcing sure. them or not. So there's, there is a discussion, and it's, it's very lively, but it's in a, an environment that most people are just absolutely confused by the whole thing, if they know anything about it at all. And I will tell you a story. I, about four or five years ago, I met the Controller General of the United States. And according to statute, he has to do an audit each year. We haven't done an audit for the past 10 or 12 years, because he can't get a clean audit because of the Pentagon. Oh, that's an old story, isn't it? And, and there it is. So we, I mean, you know, national this security. Is, this is one of the real issues. And so I think people who, who are in the know know about it, and the people who don't, don't know about it. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And we talked at Bloomberg News about this all afternoon in a fascinating discussion where they said, yes, some specialists know. But think about this. There aren't that many accountant journalists. Bloomberg, the newsroom felt that you know, they wanted one. And they do have writers doing it. And they lamented that there wasn't more interest in it. Most people don't know anything about it. It was still part of the curriculum up until World War II. A, a double entry accounting is not in the curriculum anymore. People don't know what it is. You can go to the best schools in the country and never know anything about accounting. In the Renaissance, in the Enlightenment, people would have thought that quite terrifying that any householder would not know accounting. My suggestion in the book is, is that the crisis is not necessarily there with the experts, although part of it is, um, but in the general population, which is completely ignorant of this basic Thing. People take mortgages without knowing what depreciation is, without being able to balance a book at all. That won't work. In the Renaissance and in the Middle Ages, they warned about that. They said you couldn't hold on to your house or to your property or to a cow unless you knew how to manage these things. I would add a further word of language, and that is the language of financial literacy. Yes, absolutely. Which, which really sort of transcends even the accounting. So when you talk about right. financial literacy, yeah. it's very low in this country. Absolutely. I think, there's, I think it's a crisis. That's the argument I make in my book. I think we're in, in, in deep accord on this. By the way, you know that um, when Churchill, and I think it was 1913, comes in to take over the Navy, he finds that they've been completely cooking the books. They're broke. And they can, remember, this is always the case in the navies and militaries because they say national security. We can't talk about it. But he finds out in 1913 that he has no money. And that's one of the reasons that a military historian friend of mine tells me that he starts building submarines rather than battleships because he has no money. It's cheaper to actually do that. The history of submarines actually starts out with bad accounting practices. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoy, especially the art, who knew art and accounting. Um, <laughs>
But throughout your talk, I felt this kind of dichotomy existed in your narrative between success and failure, good accounting versus bad accounting, low level, high level, doing it well, not doing it well, good records, bad records. This was an ongoing. Thing. Right. Sure. And I, I just I would like you to talk a little bit more about this normative. Um, so you know. I won't name names, but there are some very good historians, even in this room, who are doing accounting of slavery. Right, sure. And sometimes those books are beautifully balanced. Oh, yeah. Is that good accounting? I mean, oh. I, I, let me just say one more thing about that. Just, or what accounting can make us do, the things sure. that can make us do, the way it can make us see things. You know, yeah, absolutely. The talk of the fog of war. What about you know, the fog of accounting? Sure. And so I was just, I, I don't know, that seemed to be absent uh, it, from it, the narrative. It's in the book. And I mentioned very clearly that it's a lot easier to, sla to, to do slave trading when you're only looking at the books and it's only in numbers. And by the way, um, I mean, I go through the account books of people like Jefferson and I point out it's, it's absolutely horrific to read the passages about slavery and the way he talks about it in his account books. However, it was very important. The, there's the normative thing that's good. It's very good that many of the founding fathers knew a lot about accounting, believe me. This, this whole project wouldn't have worked very creepy when they spin around people like Washington and others and go do it for well, why slavery. Why is that a spin? Why is that a spin? It, it's, it's accounting. Right, it's accounting. It can go both You're, ways. Well, it's because because it's the, the same accounting. Well, it's the same accounting. But, well, but, but because because there is a morality to things, and and in the books there are books which balance out and show profit and don't necessarily that doesn't necessarily come from human suffering, and there are books in which there there is human suffering. The books show it just in numbers, and they do clean it up, and they, they fix it up. I mean, I, I talk about this a lot in the book. What I am also talking about is a non-normative thing in which we constantly end up dropping these books or ignoring them. There's actually, Lloyd's Bank actually um, did a study, uh, I forget what it's called, but it was in the, I, I wrote about it in that New York Times piece, in which people get phobias of, of, of their own accounts. Uh, I can tell you it's tax time. I have, I have a phobia of my accounts right now. I mean, I don't want to look at them. And, and, and there's a, there was another study that just came out recently that said that the worse your accounts are, there's a phenomenon of as people get poorer and poorer, they stop doing accounting because it's so horrible. Louis XIV had the same problem, except, you know, at a different level. So there's a whole other story of, of dysfunctioning and, 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 and of human nature, and then of cultural management, where cultures can't deal with it, and... It's a very odd thing, and I hope that came across, that I, I find accounting to be incredibly strange, rather than simply normative. However, at the same time, you really do need to do it in order to run a business and to manage a household, or to trade slaves, which I hope you're not involved with, right? <laughs> yes? So there's no audit in this country. Is the $17 trillion deficit anywhere accurate? And is there a reckoning coming? Um, I can't answer those questions, but I can tell you this. I can tell you this. From the earliest publications of the budgets, the numbers are fudged. I do think that the Congressional Budget Office does a pretty impressive job with what it gets. I think there are some numbers out there, and I think those who are trained can get a sense. But, there are, but accountants will always tell you, remember this is an inexact art, and our valuations might not be completely accurate. They, they, they're not always allowed to say that, by the way, in uh, uh, their statements, and balance sheets don't always have this. But there's a large tradition of fudging the books. Is a reckoning coming? Uh, after talking to some leading financial journalists today, I got kind of worried that there really was one guy. <laughs> I've been talking to some really serious experts about finance today. Um, I was deeply, deeply concerned. But that's just me. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you didn't write, I guess you didn't write about it in the book, but, but as you were talking about the gradual disappearance of, of the accountant, I was thinking, especially in, in, in the second half of the, of the 20th century, I was thinking that may come, I, I wonder what you say about it, that comes along with, with the rising prominence of the market, paradoxically. Mm. Even though the market right. rely on counting numbers completely, right. you have more and more focus on the markets. And bankers. And, and yeah, and, and financial institutions, and less on the accounting practices that produce the numbers on which markets trade. Do you know that the accounting schools fret about their image? I don't, and I, and I, <laughs> they, they fret about their image. Their image has been tarnished, it's also not considered sexy, and if you're an honest accountant, you're probably not going to make as much as a banker. 
Um, and so the accounting schools struggle with trying to get better students who want to go into banking. They want them to be auditors. They need skilled auditors, and they struggle with this. At USC, we struggle with this stuff. Um, those are big, big questions. But the image of the accountant across the 20th century is a fascinating story of the mismanagement of a brand that was actually created by the British in around 1904 as the, the impartial Sherlock Holmes of finance, who didn't care about the money, was there for reason and for facts. Uh, that, that image was very strong in, in, in 1904. It's not here uh, 100 years later. Yes? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very fascinating. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm actually working in environmental accounting in my PhD, and I, I discovered this story from another perspective. Uh, and what I find fascinating to just to, uh, to continue the conversation that you had with the gentleman in front of me, uh, what I find fascinating in accounting as compared to, uh, to economics in a way is that accounting uh, makes its conventions on which it is. Based explicit, and they are being discussed in political forums about the norms. Right. So, and, and where they ask questions such as, who is counting what, uh, um, for to do what, and, and, and what is the good way to, to count it, and for and it has very big consequences. For instance, when uh, in the middle of the 20th century we go from historical cost right. accounting to actuarial, absolutely, which yeah. is completely the way that yeah. it doesn't work. And 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 so and. and the same for environmental accounting. Right now, there are more and more forums open to what is the right way to measure impacts in the environment. They're still arguing about these things. Yeah. And so, and so, my question is: Do you um, do you look in your books at how different perspectives, political, economical, sociological perspectives in the world, change these political discussions? Where are the forums of these political discussions on accounting conventions are, are held? And, you, and and just one one thing that you say that really strikes me. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not wrong, but one thing that you think that really strikes me is when you say there is this painting where they, they need to be worried not to put too much faith in the company. It's not only to put too much faith in the calculations, but to put too much faith in this specific vision of the world at this specific right. time, right? So, yeah. Well, it's a mix. First, first of all, I, I go over that briefly. I talk about it, but not in enormous detail. Um, it is so complicated. The history of modern accounting over the past 40 years is so complex that it's, I mean, that's, that, that is really something that I couldn't do. I mean, I, I looked at it and I read about it and I was startled by these things. And also, the, there's still an argument about historical accounting as market to market accounting. They don't agree. And one of the interesting things about talking to real accountants is they're like, oh, no, 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 we can't be exact. We are all about doubt. The accountants themselves use a hilariously postmodern language without even knowing it. But, the, but you know, I, it's very impressive to go talk to thinking accountants. They're out there, and they will tell you a remarkable story. The, the people you least expect to tell you a story about doubt and about questioning numbers, they do it because they have to. And they say, Our, we always try and tell people what we do is inexact, and it can never be exact. And it's so fascinating. And that gets back to those paintings where you have to try and do as good a job as you can, but know that you can't fully control it. Um, it's such a remarkable cultural realization to get to that point. I find that just amazing. Most accountants are very aware of the value laden type of work that they do. Yeah, absolutely, they really are. Yeah, more than I would have thought. Nathan. Yeah, so I was wondering about the, the category of accounting. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of take it apart a little bit and tell us. Well, I guess I'm curious, if you take it apart, how does your story work? Because it seems to me that there, this, the, the accounting, as you're describing to us, is kind of a package of different strategies and practices. There's a kind of physical practice of adding up numbers in two columns. There's a kind of moral discourse surrounding it. Um, there's a kind of cultural confidence game where you, you know, it projects an image of rectitude and whatever to, to, to the public. To what extent, though, are those, are those is that kind of a, an integrated package? To what extent do those things have to go together? Are they stuck together? And if they're not stuck together, then, and this comes back a little bit to the question of, 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 uh, of accounting for slaves, if they're in fact not stuck together, if there isn't a moral valence to having the books, then how does this, then how does this work? I mean, in other words, does your, does your story depend on having a kind of integrated package of different kinds of cultural behaviors that, all, that fit together, kind of, that are kind of locked together? Sure helps, and that's, that's all I can say. Is I would think it would help um, in a perfect world. Um, 
but certainly it helps to have that greater view. Um, you know, that's why I find 18th century America so fascinating. Most Americans, I mean, you helped me with that chapter, so you know the information better than I do. But, you know, most Americans didn't know how to do accounting, but a lot of the leading citizens, many of whom were forming the government and, and, and other things, knew how to do this accounting, and a lot of the people that had plantations were really good at doing it. It's a very double-edged sword there, where people who are doing plantation accounting, which is horrific, are also the people who are doing the accounting to create this free government. But that's the story of America. That's, and that's also the Jefferson, in a nutshell, the great writer of liberty, who's a slaveholder. I mean, there's that, I think there is that internal tension in accounting. But the Dutch get it. This is something that can be absolutely moral and good and bring you close to God, if you believe that. But it is also the tool of fraud. It is both. And we, and we have to, and the more you know about accounting, the more wary and careful you will be of this great potential power, but which also has the force, when it's done badly, on the Bear Stearns Lehman Brothers scale, to wipe out the whole system. I mean, bad accounting on that scale. And, and, and there was a lot of bad accounting going on there. Um, wow. It can cause incredible havoc. The, the, the linchpin of capitalism is its Achilles heel. Yes. I, I do. I read a lot of 15th century account books ah. in, in Siena. Ah. I have to tell you, there's tons of auditors. Yeah. And it, it's absolutely central to the functioning of the government. Yeah. So it's not just Holland. Oh, yeah. No, no, I know. I mean, it's so detailed. It's absolutely. No, it, every official gets put against the wall. I mean, there's always an overage. They always spend too much. They're always being... Yeah. I mean, their estates are always being done. It's remarkable how insistent they are getting every nickel. You will, you will find... Banking culture. It's a, and it's also a republic. Right. And in republics, you find a lot of auditing. Um, one of the things, uh, and I talked about this with Paolo from the early days, it blows me away, is that Siena, that, that, that great book of the Comune of Siena, where Siena, the city-state of Siena, has a big double entry ledger with all these threads and special pages so no one can cheat and double signatures to keep the books of the Republic because they believe it's the only way to do that. We will not see a system like that again until around 1720. That's not really effective in 1720. You don't see it as standardized governmental practice in the West until the 19th century. What the medieval Italians do, we lose for hundreds and hundreds of years. I found that deeply sobering. So. I think when the government gets weaker, though, the accounting falls apart. <laughs> it's, it's a chicken and egg thing. But I mean, absolutely. it's actually the same story you're telling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, if you can see that governments were threatened, actually, by accountants, uh, I mean, I would say that if the standards are there, and there must be an authority, actually, uh, for the accounting standards, why isn't the government just in the beginning and maybe the standards are like? When? Well, um, look at the, it's the Italian time, look at the Dutch time. They, they didn't have, it wasn't a profession. It was something that everyone was supposed to do. Now it's a profession, which means that not everybody does it. Um, I don't know what works better. A general culture where everybody does it, and then they're also professionals? Or this thing that we have now where just the professionals do it? Um, we do know that having government oversight of accounting can help. It can also wreak some havoc, too, as the accountants will tell you, they feel their hands are tied behind their backs against the banks and that they can't do good audits right now. Everybody's got a story. It's not completely clear who's right on this. It's very complicated stuff. We're in a very, we're in a hyper-financial moment that is so complex that it's very, very hard to figure it out right, in many ways. Sorry, you had a question, sir? Yeah, the, the danger and the probably the hubris, does that come out of what well, they tell the good accounting, the double entry books, or bad accounting, or both. What is that danger that you like uh, that texture? That you're talking about? I, I mean, it comes off of this idea. This is from Saint Matthew that yes, you should you should earn a profit and you should keep good books, but be careful with worshiping that or trusting it too much. And that that's just that's from the scriptures. That's a that's that's an old message. But the Dutch really picked that up, and they're really keen on it uh, in in Dutch Calvinism in that sort of sense that you have to be. Be careful with thinking. What's, what's the point where it turns? What is, what is that point? 
fraud. It's fraud. Fraud. I mean, fraud. Fraud by great accountants is where it turns. And and that's what those warning pictures are. They show that their tools are fantastic and they're 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 doing everything they're supposed to do, but there's something wrong. Be careful with the numbers. It's a simplistic question, but so do you think double entry books in an ideal world would solve the present situation? Um, I, you know what? I, I talked about this today again for a long time. I actually think learning how to keep the books is very important, even though you can have a, an app or something that does it for you, because you also learn how it works, you learn the moral of balance, you learn the dangers of not being disciplined. It, it is, in medieval Italy, it is a, it's a, well, there's another long tradition of people keeping moral account books too, and Paolo is an expert on that. Um, in, in all of uh, the Christian tradition, Ben Franklin keeps a moral account book in which he crosses off things. Jesuits keep moral account books. There's a, a whole, and Jesuits also keep accounts, but they don't teach accounting because there are all these funny relationships. But the, the loss of the moral account book, too, has also followed that as well. People kept moral account books. Um, I, I'm not going to say if I think that's a good idea or not. I just put it out there as an interesting cultural cultural practice that we've lost. Two questions. The first is you keep talking about the moral of balance, and now if we all just learn to do our accounting, then we would become like, kind of somehow personally acquainted with the moral of balance. It seems like it's very different to have some kind of morality coming out of the balance itself versus keeping a moral account where you're trying to make a moral judgment for your account. So, one Yeah, I totally agree, but it's a start. Where do you start? Well, if we want to have a conversation, remember this also. I don't know if I mentioned this. I'm not. I don't want to, you know, compliment myself because you can read the book and you can decide if it's any good or not. But there is no history of accountability. I mean, I looked. This was the first sort of long attempt to write a history of accountability. I find that unnerving and kind of scary. So where do we start? Well, my research shows that learning this is one place just to begin. We've got to go back to the fundamentals. Then we can talk about how it doesn't function and how terrifying it is, but we can't even get there. People don't know what this is. People don't know what double entry accounting is. <coughs> Most people. It's remarkable. So then, but you are saying that the process of keeping an account somehow has, like there's morality to the balance itself. There's a moral to the story that you write if you keep your account book each night. And that's what people talk about from the Middle Ages in Italy to 18th century Britain to someone like Peeps who goes to bed and if his books are balanced, he feels good. At the end of the day, you're supposed to balance your books. And then you go to sleep. With your, with your, your, then you pray afterwards. Um, but, but the point is, 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 is that, yeah, to a certain extent, I think in a hyper-financial world, it might be a great place to start conversing because it also allows you to converse about calculation and to even begin to start talking about the crazy financial world we live in. We live in a crazy financial world and most people are financially illiterate. So this is a story about education and culture. There are many other stories that could be told as well. So I also think we see very much eye to eye about financial literacy and how important it is. But I, my other question was, why is double entry bookkeeping the key? So I always felt like historians paid way too much attention to double entry bookkeeping and not enough to cost accounting and to time books and to no. appreciation. But that's part, it's part of it. Well, that all comes out of double entry. You need double entry first. If you read the history of cost accounting, which is really fascinating, and then Josiah, I mean, I talk about some of it in Josiah Wedgwood's role in really perfecting it. It comes out of double entry bookkeeping, and then you get the more complex things, and depreciation really is I mean, a fascinating concept, but the, but the Italians have it early on. Cost accounting is rudimentary cost accounting in the Middle Ages, but it really gets systematized in the Midlands, in Britain, during the first Industrial Revolution. That's definitely true, but is it, it's com I don't think it's coming out of double entry bookkeeping. Yeah, it's not coming out of single entry bookkeeping because nobody does that because they can't run a business doing it. It's coming out of attempts to value capital. And then put it into the books. Read, if you go back and read McKendrick's article on cost accounting of Josiah Wedgwood, you can see the process by which he starts losing money, goes back to audit his double entry books, and realizes it's time that's his problem. And then in Bar Salem, in his factory, he does the famous thing where he hooks up the clock and starts clocking people's hours. One of the biggest moments 
in the history of humanity and industry is the clock in Bar Salem. It's pretty rough and intense and effective. <laughs> and, and you can go buy some Wedgwood today if you'd like. If you got $1,200 for a setting, you can still do it. Yes? So I'm trying to work out the exact relationship between the state and the merchants in the story. I, I was struck by the way you started talking about the state so often, centering, and centering around the state. And this is a story that has almost always begun with merchants. And so I wondered if that was, to some, that's an explicit intervention on your part, to try to have us think about this and the, the rise of accounting, something that is dependent upon the state. And yet, when you talk about the Dutch, it seems that the argument is going the other direction. It's only when there's a robust culture of accounting amongst the, the folk that you are able to then uh, get to a state that works properly. Possibly. It did in Holland. I'm a historian, so I don't make sweeping judgments like that. But what is very, very interesting is to see these states try and try again and fail. One of the reasons that the Spanish fail and the French fail is they just don't have any accountants that will work for them. And to train accountants takes so long. The medieval Italians say in their books, you have to start as a child, you have to be beaten. And not everybody, I have one of those where there's a hand, have you ever seen that? If you don't keep it, if you don't put the entry in, you actually have to be hit. I mean, that's just a Renaissance educational rule. You know, there's no, nothing special in there. But um, this, this deep discipline is necessary. Well, guess what? If you're a state and you have the Spanish Empire, it's a big, 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 big state, and you need accountants, and you can't get them, and you can't train them. So you go to Seville, you get a couple people. It's not enough. Nobody knows anything about it. A few Italians come in. They won't do it for you. It's, it's wild to see, to see France, for example, in 1726, after the, their stock market bubble. There is a proposal, an internal memo, which only three people have basically seen. It's huge. I read it. It was a horrible thing to read, but quite interesting, by the Paris brothers, um, who are trying to get double entry put into the state, and their enemies, who don't want to be taxed, say it's much too expensive for this state to train the accountants. And that's when the minister Fleury says, okay, if it's expensive, we don't have any money anyway, we're not going to train the accountants. And they lose on the cost of doing this. Um, it's a complicated story. Again, I don't have a chicken and egg. I don't have a pure causality. But I do see historically some impressive moments where these elements work together. That's the historian's job. Yes. Can you just say a little more about what you think Dickens was doing in the 19th century? I wasn't sure you showed a picture from Christmas Carol. Yeah. What is Dickens doing? Is Dickens is thinking and struggling and thinking about accounting, whether it's Good or bad, he knows both. He thinks it should be discussed. There's the cir circumlocution office, the middle door, where everything goes in and nothing comes out. And it's the art of not doing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's this remarkable thing, this world where you have all these rational account books and yet nothing works. And that's Dickens' world. In mean, Dickens' early modern world is a world that's slightly nightmarish, and very nightmarish for him personally. He goes to the Marshall C. Debtors prison. The thing that strikes me about Dickens is that he is a moral and social proselytizer who happens to be one of the greatest novelists of all time. I'll stand by that. I, I know some people don't like Dickens. He staggers me. And he thinks and writes a lot about accounting. I find that remarkable. And he's not the only one, either. I mean, Balzac is my other favorite novelist. Tolstoy doesn't write about accounting. I love him, but that's another question. Um, what I think he's doing is trying to make a point about this. I don't think he's struggling with it. I don't think he has the full answer. But he clearly wants people to be aware of how it does and doesn't work. Um, I haven't scanned him for references to St. Matthew, because I wonder if he's thinking about that. They are thinking about it at other times because they're constantly painting Matthew with his books. So that's there. I would think that Dickens was very aware of that. I mean, go back. I haven't done the entire works of Dickens for this. I've, I've read there the books. Oh, yeah. Well. Oh, oh, yeah, his father. There are, in, in his story, Mr. Micawber, there are all these good accountants. And they're up against the bad ones, too. I mean, it's the story of good and evil. There are these two choices in accounting. That awareness, is very. I think it's very important. I think Dickens' sophistication is, is, is grand. As a financial thinker, as someone who also is using language, that I don't know anybody like him. It's just Balzac, of course. But he's, he's, we've also lost... Do we have writers of this quality? And do we have them writing about financial problems like accounting? I don't think so. Um, I think that could be helpful. But that's, that's a, in an ideal utopia that, you know, might not, probably doesn't exist. 
So as a short-term solution, we have a lot more uh, editorials and newspaper journalists uh, understanding accounting and telling us about it, or do we need to get back into the school? I'd say, I mean, we talked about this this morning at Bloomberg News. We, we thought both. Both. What would be more important? I don't think... I, I just think just to begin the discussion, and journalists are the ones who can begin the discussion, they're the only ones who could put it back in the, into the curriculum. If, if we want to be a country of, of homeowners, which I don't think we really are right now. Well, I'm, I'm Australian, and we're a country of homeowners, and what you say about mortgages is completely correct. I, when the GFC was happening, I have, and I don't know whether you know, in, in Australia they put in this homeowner's grant, and it was your first home, you got all these extra benefits and extra money to go buy. It's a complete market distortion. And I have friends who went into it, and I said, before you go into it, just shut up while you're up, which is single entry, county really, right. but just look at your money flows both ways, and right. are you going to afford it, and are you going to afford it in 10 years? That's right. And they right. don't stop on what they do. Absolutely, but remember, Australia, you know, yeah. according... So we are a country at home, and people don't do it, and they got and get in trouble, and we obviously did too. Um, there's just an old maxim of, of, of early medieval finance that the householder must know good accounting. By the way, one journalist told me that Australia, rather than having big, the big four firms, has 120 or so competing firms, and it led to better, better financial accounting during the crisis. That was a claim that I heard in London last week, which I thought was quite interesting. I, I don't know if it's true, but I thought it was fascinating. I won't comment. Okay. <laughs> Just a comment. Uh, one of the issues that I've seen over the past perhaps 50 to 75 years has been the growth of the footnotes to the financial statements. Oh, uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and so yeah. not just the numbers. If you look at financial statements at the turn of the century right. for public companies, yeah. the footnotes were just a very minor portion of the statement. If you look at major corporations today, let's say a, a city corp, right. we're looking at 250 pages right. of a financial statement of which probably 20 pages are the numbers and 230 are the footnotes. And so the footnotes really have taken over from the numbers. I mean, hmm. to understand any of the sets of financial statements today, you have to really draw on the footnotes. What's so funny is the accountants say they want more explanations to say that we're not totally sure. It's, it is a remarkable form of writing and expression. I mean, one that we don't talk about very much. That alone is a great story of footnotes and of, and of how, to, how these things even work. People don't even have any idea of this. And people are arguing about it. These are, those, are, those are issues, especially for auditors. Well, I, I sort of wonder if, that, if, if that's more of the story than you've laid out, in the sense that it seems to me that accounting, even good accounting, has a fundamental, has fundamental problems with it, right. in the, including the fact that a balance sheet hides much more than it necessarily reveals a lot of the times, right? Sometimes, and even yeah. even a, even a good one, right? Sort of accountants have always kind of been aware that even if they're doing their best, there's a certain amount of sure. elaborate, a certain amount of discretion involved there. So that process whereby accounting sort of creates, enshrines a sort of perfected picture of an enterprise, even when it's done with the best intentions, and even when it's done sort of, um, you know, according to the sort of rules, doesn't that in itself start to generate problems, right? The fact that you get a picture that then people believe that once you have good accounting, then people forget the well, messiness behind it, absolutely. and that sort of creates the... Sure, absolutely, and that's one of the things I'm talking about, but if you think about the state of the balance sheet in 1929, when there were no rules, and these guys were just producing fake balance sheets, and there were warnings about the Great, the, the great Crash, uh, there are better and worse balance sheets, and, but there are also, all, all, also problems. But to understand that there are problems and to have constructive discussions about them is, is I think, almost as important as ha having those sheets to begin with. The problem is that we've just, we've, we've just sort of accept them as being there. But people in the business know the problems. I have friends who are in private equity. And I say, so when you go to buy a $700 million arms company, 
do you trust the books? And they of course not. We don't trust the books. We have our own people analyzing the company, and then I use instinct. <laughs> I said, wow. And that's, that's a big business lesson right there. I mean, one way you could tell the story would be one of just gradual abstraction. Mm. And the, 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 the rise of accounting is, you know, first it's, it's double entry accounting, sure. it's the development of a balance sheet. Yeah. Now the abstraction is you go from everyone doing the accounting to professionals doing it, and then you go from, you know, 100 companies to four companies, right? It's, it's a process of increasing right. sort of black boxing. And, and that's why I think we need some kind of basic literacy to get up against this beast which is running everything, and we have no handle on it. We've got to start somewhere. I mean, that's, that's my only true conclusion, and as a historian, I shouldn't probably even be saying that. But I believe, personally, that that's the case. We have to start the discussion. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a long and complicated one. Um, it's, it's tricky out there. I mean, it's a tricky, tricky time. And we're in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, thanks. Isn't there still a lingering fear of ending up like the group brothers? If you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, according to the journalists, yeah. I mean, people that really want to do the audits and blow the whistles can find themselves in deep trouble. Yeah. Clear audits are a uh, dangerous thing sometimes. Thank you very much.